Speaking of torturing people. And we go a little something like this. Hit it. It is time for the uh, weekend review here. Another week has come and gone, if you know what I mean. As I look at the calendar, I see we've reached August 16. We've survived a summer that was hot as cakes on the griddle. And now we'll try to survive the state's takeover of North Middle. That's right. The new school year begins Monday and the mind will boggle. And if you misbehave at North Middle this year, you're getting a face full of Kevin Pitsnoggle. No lie. The young man who led WVU to an Elite Eight in a Final Four is now the principal at North, and it's his job to settle the score. We've got a new superintendent of schools named Dr. Ryan Sachs. And if you're talking about his past, please just stick to the facts. And speaking of facts, don't go to Facebook for them where lies persist. Because what's published there may just have to cease and desist. It's... It's just <laughs> it's just the last week things in the state got that much better when J.B. McCuskey and Larry Pack signed a tax cut letter. It seems the mechanisms were meant to ignite the trigger. The cut stands at 4%, but Big Jim wants it even bigger. He says we can afford it. He says he turned this state around, if you remember. But there's no August special session to take it up, so you'll just have to wait until September. Olympian Jordan Childs certainly had a week to examine, as her bronze medal count was feast or famine. She didn't have a bronze until she did or didn't, but always another appeal beckons. All of this over a brief period of time, violation measured in all of four seconds. Jordan Childs may want to change out her coach for an attorney at law, because the turn the Olympics just took went less athletic and more legal from what I saw. I'm not in the Olympics, I'm too old, but even when I was younger, I wasn't ready. But I think right now I'm better prepared to compete, represented by Carl, Schultz, and Ferretti. <laughs> I don't recall those fee negotiations, actually, Rob. So we may have to go back on that just a hair bit. All right, now he's joined the complainers as well. That leaves you, Bill. You're it. You're my golden light this morning. Mr. Positivity. Yeah. Mr. Ferretti, you're on the clock with issue number one. Rob, uh, be honest. Is there any alcohol involved when you write these intros? <laughs> I'm on video, correct? I can't. This is on being recorded. No, no, it's just straight hard drugs. I don't do alcohol anymore. Just nothing but hard drugs for me. That's it. That's it, Rob, baby. Uh, my topic uh, this morning is going to be about uh, cell phones in schools. Now, the larger issue here is how dangerous cell phone usage is for our youth. Uh, Jonathan Haidt, who is a social psychologist and has wrote extensively on the subject, uh, has a book out. The, it's called The Anxious Generation, The Great re re I think it's a hard word to say, rewiring. Do you want Do you want Bill to help you with that word? Bill, you want to tackle that one? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Hey, Joe, I saw the text you sent to Rob last week. Oh, we went off air. So <laughs> talking about my pronunciations. <laughs> And we're no longer friends, my friend. <laughs> yeah. Uh, speaking of alcohol in the morning here. Yeah. Um, the, the book is The Great Rewiring of Childhood. is causing an epidemic of mental illness. Now, uh, of course, Jonathan Haidt talks extensively about the fact that our children use the phones as a gateway to social media, and that's really harmful. My goodness, one of the statistics is just shocking to me where he cites uh, – data from the American Psychological Association that over 30% of girls under the age of 16 have thought of suicide. Uh, if that doesn't get you, I, I don't know what does, but uh, there, there's a real problem there overall. But he has focused also on cell phones in schools, and he is a big believer in the strictest of policies regarding cell phones, indicating that they should basically be banned. Children under 16 shouldn't have them. But uh, if they do, they shouldn't be anywhere near a school setting. Uh, earlier this week, Rob, you had a couple school board members on, and I listened to the show then, and they talked about the new Berkeley County Schools policy regarding cell phone usage and bans. And essentially, as I understand it, the, the policy locally is going to be uh, not during instruction time. They have to be stowed away. Uh, but if they're at recess or study hall or if they're – uh, at, at lunch, they're going to be allowed to have access to their cell phones. Uh, I tend to believe that that is not going to be a strict enough policy. I believe that the strictest policy possible should be implemented. 
And I'm um, throwing out this morning for discussion just a couple aspects of this, and, and uh, our panel can take it any way they want to. Uh, the questions I had uh, regarding the Berkeley County Schools policy is how strict is it going to be? Is there going to be progressive discipline? How, how's that going to be meted out if uh, the students are inclined to violate this policy? What are we going to do about parental pushback? Because there will be some. Because uh, as we know, some parents like to text their kids throughout the day, including when they're on the bus and in school. Uh, so how's the school to react to parental pushback? And what about the teachers? Are we not laying on them additional responsibilities now uh in addition to instructing our kids now they got to start surveilling them and monitoring them and see if according to the policy of berkeley county if they have the school cell phones on their person stowed away in a backpack or in their pocket are the teachers now going to be having the responsibility of figuring out are they somehow uh secretly accessing the phones because the phones are still on their person a lot of aspects to this. Uh, I think uh, it's going to be uh, a work in progress as this policy goes forward. But I'm interested in some thoughts on this from the panel. Yeah. And in general, do you think it's a good policy? I'll throw that one in there on top of that there, Joe. All right, Jason, let's start with you first. I think uh, restricting cell phone use in schools is a really good policy. And, and I want to commend uh, the Berkeley County BOE uh, for implementing a policy. And, and I agree with Joe. My understanding is that it is to be away and off except for during the times that he outlined. Uh, and, and I agree with the doctor that, uh, that Joe mentioned that uh, it should be as restrictive as possible. And, and certainly there is an additional burden on the teacher uh, to, to make sure that the student uh, doesn't have the cell phone out, that it is uh, stowed away and that it is off. Um, but I think that the value for that, for the student, uh, not only for the reasons that Joe mentioned from the uh, what it does to the, the, the psyche of young people, but uh, the fact that children aren't learning from the teacher because they're distracted by a cell phone, they're texting one another. Uh, and, and I think that I, I never want to discount uh, the reason for a phone and, and to be able to access the outside in the event of an emergency. Um, but at the same time, we cannot jeopardize an entire generation's education um, simply to have cell phones at their uh, disposal uh, every second of the day. So uh, I absolutely support uh, restrictive um, use of cell phones in schools. Uh, I, I, it is the burden is on the teacher, but I, I think the teachers can handle it. I remember being in school, the teachers cracked down on chewing gum all the time, and that was a huge distraction. And, and all that was was just annoying. Uh, but this really um, impedes uh, learning uh, for students. And, and so again, I commend the BOE. Mike, while you're sharing a screen with Jason, take it. Well, I, there's nobody in this room that's more cynical about the potential evil of electronic communications than, than I am. So I strongly support a limitation or banning of cell phones in public schools. And, and uh, I, I agree that, you know, it puts a little more of a burden on teachers, but it, but it, it, it really enables them to teach uh, it, it, you know, it just is a, a different additional responsibility to stop this stuff. And that's, that's the, you know, that's the evil of the electronic communications that, that uh, we have. Mr. Stubblefield. Yeah, like everybody else, I agree with the policy. I think something we need to do for the many reasons that have been mentioned here and reasons that have been mentioned the, during the discussion. Uh, to me, though, it's going to be how is it going to be enforced, how they're going to walk the talk, if you will. As one of our uh, contributors on the chat says, what are the procedures? We know the overall guidance, but what are the procedures? Uh, and the other part is how will the system, the school system, stand up to a attack by the t by the by the parents and how will social media come into play there's going to be quite a bit of pushback on this and the social media is a wonderful opportunity uh i don't it's not an opportunity it's something they'll they'll take advantage of of, uh, of trying to let their voices be known and the social media can be a powerful force uh, I say that as someone that does not participate in social media, but from what I've heard people say. Uh, 
and I, I think the um, uh, I think the concept is good. I think something we have to do. There is no reason not to do it. I applaud the Board of Education in Berkeley County and Ohio County and the other counties that are taking this step forward. But that's only one half the story. The hard part of the story comes up now: how they're going to actually implement it. Mr. Schultz. Um, yeah, I wanted to focus a little bit on on something that Bill touched on, uh, which is the parental pushback. There are families, some families, where momentary, unplanned communication kind of has to happen. You know, you can imagine somebody, a kid in school, whose grandma is, um, you know, on her last day, in her last days, or grandpa, and they need to be able to be contacted quickly. Um, so. Can you call the school? In other words, this isn't just going to be teachers involved. There's also going to be administrators and phone answerers who are going to get news that they have to go and deliver to the kids. Um, it, it, I agree that it's a good policy to have. I suspect, like many good ideas, it's going to be more expensive <laughs> for the school systems than we're uh, maybe suggesting here. And so... Uh, you know, it, to control that sort of thing is, uh, especially in high school, once it's become, you know, uh, I don't know how young the youngest kids are who have cell phones. I don't suspect there are kindergartners showing up with cell phones, but there might be. Yeah, there is. Um, so, you know, but <laughs> certainly at the higher levels. And they're better with them than we are, by the way. It's going to be an expensive, uh, an expensive proposition. I, I, you know, I think you're going to have administrators involved. There's going to be disciplinary stuff. Um, you're going to be calling parents in. Um, well, but, but Larry, what what is different about that from when we were kids and when your parent needed to reach you because your grandparent died or whatever? They called the school office and then someone came and got you out of the classroom. Yeah, um, I would say the only thing that's different about that is we got we we seemingly have a lot more trauma now and a lot more difficulties with people. When I was a kid, um, my the state I lived in didn't lead the nation in opioid overdose deaths the way West Virginia does. So there's an awful lot of stuff that happens now that seemingly did not happen in families nearly as much back in the day. And, and one, one of the reasons for that, I agree with you, the difference is the uncontrolled access of bad people to children's minds and and consciousness through electronic media sure and and that's going to happen after school if this oh is yeah, successful. yeah 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 <laughs> but, but but at least the schools are you know yeah. with this rule will will have some you know safeguards for the children well at least the kids will get an education during that seven hour period i think which is more important right and, which and, is why they're there it right will distract and, their education yeah. right so, Joe, Joe, they, pushback has been mentioned on this, and there are three attorneys in the room here, right? So, typically, in the past, whether or not Berkeley County Schools fits into this or not, but many schools do, perhaps Berkeley County has as well, when there's been strong pushback on a legal matter, not wanting to risk a larger defeat that could cost money, schools have quickly folded the tent and gone back on controversial policies. Joe, Mike, Larry, in regards to the legality of the move like this, is there the potential of some type of pushback that would cause a collapse on this policy? Well, I, uh, even though our firm does a lot of work for the school board, uh, I'm just speaking independently, and uh, I, I, I think it's absolutely a legitimate policy and that will be held, upheld and it, it should, be, should be upheld by the courts I mean, it, it, you know they certainly didn't have pay phones in the hall which was the only other kind of yeah. non-personal phone you could you could uh, or non uh, home bound phone they didn't have pay phones in the hall of my high school or grade school and and so yeah i mean we have worked on a means of communicating bad news uh, either from the parents to the child or from the child to the parents um, still, there are going to be some exceptions along the way. 
And you're going to have to be very careful how you draft these rules so as to make sure that um, you don't cut somebody off from an important communication. Joe? Uh, yeah, I, I can. There are going to be instances where uh, a, uh, a student is going to have to have access to their phone. I, I think Jackie Long and most power spoke to this. Uh, some children monitor their glucose levels by use of their phone. And uh, there may be other health reasons where they have to have access. Uh, I'm sure parents are going to come in to the school board and say, my child has a job after school and his or her work schedule is subject to change at any time. And the employer needs to get a hold of little Johnny or Susie and let them know when they're due for work or whether they should show up that afternoon after school. Uh, you know, things of that nature are going to come up. Uh, and, and I think the school's going to have to be uh, a little flexible. However, the primary function of the school is to instruct. And if a cell phone becomes an impediment to instruction, I don't see how a legal challenge overall to the policy is going to, to prevail. I think the school is going to be on very solid ground here to say, just like a child having a Rubik's Cube or, or some other toy in school, and, and instead of listening to the teacher and doing their coursework, uh, the school has the ability to ban these items if they are a distraction not only to the student, but to other students in the class. Uh, that, that, that's, uh, I think, a vital aspect of any challenge to the policy. I think the school will be uh, on solid ground. Jeff Haddix brought this up in our comment section. It was uh, something I was thinking of as well when we were talking about the need to reach a child quickly about some emergency in the home. And as we discussed, when we were all younger, the principal or the counselor or someone came to your classroom and got you out of school. So your first communication about that was with a trained professional yep. who was uh, had the ability and the education and the training to deal with breaking that news to you as opposed to it's blurted out on your phone, uh, mom's dead, give me a call, uh, something like that. There's, that's a hook of a... In a classroom with 25 other students. Right. All as right. opposed to a guidance counselor setting you down privately. Absolutely. Thank you, Jason. That's a perfect way to further develop the thought on that one. And, and I think that's even a, a better way to handle it than just blurting it out on, on your telephone in, in that instance or circumstance. Uh, in, uh, Mike Height talked uh, in our section as well Mike, about uh, he's talked to teachers who have already worked in this setting. And they say the burden on them in regards to finding the, you know, dealing with the phone situation is not that great. And Mike also said there's not very much pushback from parents in other cases, other places. Yeah. And, well, and Joe, well, with your well, premise well, in, in discussing with Jackie Long and Melissa Power, the president and vice president of the BOE, which is implementing this policy, they also uh, talked to us about the fact that after some time, uh, they've heard reports that kids actually welcome the break from their phones. The pressure's not there to constantly have to be re returning a, a text or a comment or liking or disliking or whatever. Go ahead, Joe. Oh, yeah. The, the, the author of the book I referenced, uh, he, there's a chapter in there where he does sur uh, surveys of students, and a majority of them welcome the policy. Uh, these are students who are unfortunately subject to uh, online bullying and uh, and frankly, criminal behavior where you know people are posting pics and, and sharing them with other students that are uh, pornographic in nature. You can just imagine. So, uh, a majority of students would welcome the policy. A another question I have, Rob, is: Is this a policy that is so important that the state legislature should look at instituting it statewide, as other states have? Since we have a, a uh, senator uh, amongst us this morning, I'm wondering if this is something for uh, the folks in Charleston to deal with. Uh, it's certainly, Joe, something that I'm interested in, uh, and I don't have a problem drafting legislation like that. I, at times, I um, have some uh, discomfort with some of the legislation that gets passed uh, as it relates to mandating certain um, curriculum during certain time frames and, and things that are that are very important to teach children uh, I don't know that the legislature should put it in state code that uh, this particular document or this particular um, uh, historic event needs to be taught in the school on, during this particular week and, and we get into the legislature gets into doing that sometimes 
um, even though we already know all those things are being taught uh, at the teacher's uh, you know, discretion of the time frame. Um, but as far as uh, restricting cell phone use, uh, you know, I think if the counties, if the local BOEs do the right thing and they start to, de to implement a policy that best suits them, I know Monongalia County, uh, as my understanding, has a policy that where they implement these pouches where the cell phone is is kind of locked and stored away in until the end of the day you know i think if these counties start doing the right thing uh in, in restricting cell phone use then maybe we don't need legislation to do it uh, but back to rob's point about the parental um, uh, pushback and if you know some of these counties um, are looking uh, for some backup uh, from the legislature to do that i certainly don't have any problem um, passing legislation to do that that would probably provide the best backup you can imagine and in a state that ranks so low in education trying something like this would seem to me to be as they say a no-brainer yeah amen joe final thought if you need it you got 30 seconds if not we go to the break well there's a there's a a parental psychology that we have to deal with you know years ago uh children uh, especially young boys suffered a lot of broken bones hospitals and and and, and the american medical association will tell you they don't see many broken bones anymore because these kids are locked up in their homes on their cell phones instead of out playing and as parents we think oh that they're safer that way they're not going to get snatched they're not going to get abused but we don't understand as parents that these kids are just as subject to being harmed when they're on their phone in their room locked up good point joe thank you good uh, start to the program here as we take our top of the hour break as we continue along with the Friday Five and the crew, we go to our uh, second pit stop of the day, and that is Billy Two Star. Yeah, uh, Rob, this coming week we have the Democrat National Convention. A couple of so weeks ago we had the Republican National Convention. A uh, couple of questions. Uh, one, what purpose do these conventions serve now? At one time it was really a melting pot, and I, the camera's not on me, I see Okay. At one time, is a melting pot, and they actually determined who the candidates would be. Now it's more of a Hollywood production. Uh, and uh, the last time the Democrats had theirs in Chicago, it became more than a Hollywood production. It was riots in the streets. Uh, and there's some speculation with the Hamas-Israel uh, 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 issue, uh, the Palestinians issue, that there could be some riot in the streets this time. Uh, and then you look at the makeup of the convention. The Republicans said it was going to be uh, uh, a convention of unity. It turned out to be anything but that. Uh, do you th anticipate uh, with the Democrats, it's, uh, and they're saying it's going to be unity and forward-looking, uh, aspirational goals will actually achieve it. So my thoughts uh, to the panel are a couple of thoughts. What purpose do the convention serve today, and what do you see emerging from this next week's Democratic National Con uh, Convention? Joe, let's go to you first on the phone. Well, uh, Bill, uh, it, it, I remember, uh, and uh, gosh, I was you know a, a young boy, but I remember seeing clips and reports about not only fighting in the streets in Chicago in 1968, but fighting on the floor of the convention, uh, where uh, there's there's video of. Dan Rather, a reporter at the time for CBS, famously being roughed up and thrown to the floor. Um, so it was, and, and uh, I guess it was Mayor Daley who was leading an insurrection, and it, it was uh, quite the scene. And I, I think since then, the uh, these conventions have, have kind of morphed into a, just a coronation, and as you said, a Hollywood production now. Uh, my goodness, the Republicans were trotting out Kid Rock and Hulk Hogan <laughs> for in their convention. So, uh, yeah, it's 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 a lot about glitz and glamour and and uh, uh, the presentation and, and messaging. Uh, and and I, I suspect that the Democrats uh, will be no different with their convention this coming week. Uh, however, I, I see it also as an opportunity uh, since we are in a compressed campaign here and we're now under 90 days to go, I think it's incumbent upon Democrats to more than message, but actually be a little specific about not only the party platform, but the, the real goals for uh, Harris and, and Wallace going forward. Uh, this is a way to introduce them to the larger audience of the country and to uh, 
find out what they're about and, and what uh, goals and aspirations they have for the country. I think that's going to be the goal for the uh, Democrats uh, this week. And, and I'm sure they'll pull it off because these are highly scripted and, and uh, well-funded events. So uh, uh, expect to be a little bit of a bounce afterwards, and, and then the real horse race begins. Mr. Carl. Well, the uh, the points, you know, the concerns are all make make a lot of sense. But the, the today's circumstances, it's still legally necessary, you know, un, under the rules of the of the two parties, and to you know to do, to go through this drill, and the connection to the past and the traditions, yeah, I think has an important value to you know to the legitimacy and the respect. For the outcome, mm -hmm. so so you know I, I I agree with the you know the the, the downside, but I, I think there's still a lot of plus reasons to go ahead with what they're doing, Mr. Schultz. It, yes, it will it will dominate the news at least uh, that part of the news that concerns itself with politics. Uh, you'll get prime time speeches from not just the two candidates uh, for president and vice president. But from, I wouldn't be surprised to see Josh uh, Shapiro. Shapiro from Pennsylvania and a few other speakers, um, you know, raise issues and, and push forward on platform stuff. Um, it's not exactly the same as a rally because, as Mike says, you have a duty that there's a duty to actually take a vote and do the democratic small d thing um but that is all but assured uh in an almost as strong a way as it would be had there been a full group of primaries and uh, kamala harris had won them uh, but uh, mostly it's a show and it's an opportunity for them to lay out more concrete sort of platform ideas um i'm sure you will hear more than once about the reduction of insulin prices to $35 a month for folks on Medicare and the reduction of these new 10 drugs um, um, from a bill proposed by Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, which received zero Republican votes. And so you're going to hear talk about that. Don't let anybody else tell you that uh, they're going to do something about this because they had a chance and they said no. And so, uh, you know, they'll they'll do the things that these uh, political operatives do uh, when it's time to promote your cause. Mr. So, Mr. Barrett? Well, I think the question was what comes out of the convention, and I think the short answer is a unified losing ticket. Uh, <laughs> but I think that the primary goal of these conventions at L this Larry's point, not laughing at your cuteness, I would expect him to. Uh, the, the primary goal of these recent conventions is really to don't screw it up because <laughs> – uh, you know, somebody comes out there, especially someone from the top of the ticket, the, the presidential nominee, the vice presidential nominee, says something uh, that they really shouldn't or they, they say something that, that comes out the wrong way. And that's really what the media focuses on. I, you know, you would expect um, each party to get a slight bump after the convention. Um, I, I don't think it's uh, anything that's really game changing. Uh, it's primarily used to, to rally the base. There are people obviously from all over the country that are uh, heavily involved in politics in their state and gives them the opportunity to go to a big party. Uh, so it's about rallying the base, but it also gives, I think kind of what Larry was talking about, a platform for some up and coming candidates. Uh, uh, to get on the national stage, the national convention, to, to not only get the attention of, of voters across the country, but get the, the attention of donors and, and, and some of the political king kingmakers across the com uh, country. So uh, I think it's, it's kind of about that. Um, I would expect them to, to try to talk about unity the way that the conventions always do. Uh, I would expect uh, just as many attacks on Donald Trump as there are uh, positive messages from um, the, the the Harris Walls ticket. So um, I wouldn't expect a whole lot, but again, I think the primary goal is to just not screw it up. Yeah, on that Bill? on that subject, Jason, uh, the Republicans felt they had an opportunity uh, to really uh, paint or promote this unity. In fact, going into the uh, uh, 
Donald Trump's acceptance, everybody thought it was going to be an acceptance speech of unity. And it turned out after the first 15 minutes or so, just the opposite. Uh, I would characterize that as an opportunity missed. Uh, would you agree with that? Well, I think that the unity message really started to gain momentum right after the assassin assassination attempt. And I think that's why a lot of people were looking for unity because, uh, you know, when a presidential candidate or in a former president um, has an assassination attempt and you have an event like that, typically you would expect uh, even folks that maybe weren't the biggest of Trump fans, now I'm not talking about people like Larry Schultz that view Donald Trump, but I'm talking about people that just say, you know, not really my cup of tea, I'm not a big fan of Donald Trump, still have some, some sympathy for being shot at. And so I think that's really why, I don't think if that would have happened, there would have been this ex expectation of all this unity. No, from that well, you're, you're and I looking at unity from a different aspect. I was looking at the, the message that has been conveyed by Donald Trump himself. And it went into the acceptance speech, everybody's saying he's going to say, let's all come together, we're, we're we're, we're moved forward. And he did just the opposite. He came back with, uh, uh, with his historical grievances, and that, was, that dominated much of his message. Well, I mean, you really expect a leper to change their spots? Well, that I mean, was that's who point. he is. Yeah, I mean, that's did. what they he's going to do. They well, expect, I mean, that was, yeah, and he did not. So that was know, my point. He, he is who he also. is, and, that, and because of who he is, that's part of the reason he has such a uh, wide appeal uh, nationally. Larry, Jason's statement that it sounded like a losing unified losing ticket to him. What do you think about that? Well, we'll just have to wait and see. That's what they have the uh, elections for. What I really hope, and I'm glad not to have heard here today, is something that Mr. Trump is already saying, that if I lose, it's rigged. Um, you know, uh, uh, here's West Virginia run by uh, Republicans from top to bottom with a Republican Secretary of State uh, who said the West Virginia election was a fair one in 2020, but every place else we can't be so sure. Um, <laughs> it, it, look, it, it, Donald Trump has had many opportunities to seek unity among his base and unity among people all over the country who don't have a particular home, and he routinely blows them off. The other thing is we hear him talk every single day about how America is a loser country and we're trashed and we're out of control and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, he even said the other day that uh, he was the one who got insulin prices reduced to 35 bucks a month and that's simply ridiculous. Uh, so when we compare these two things, let, let me give you a, a little taste of the Joe Biden comparison. We're going to have a young and vibrant ticket uh, on that platform. Mr. Trump, every day from Mar-a-Lago, says things that make even his supporters shake their head because they're either not true or they're wandering diatribes about electric boats and sharks. Um, so uh, this is an opportunity for the Democratic Party to show that we're not doing crazy, at least not this time. And we're, we're straight ahead trying to figure out what the American people need and find a way to pass it. Joe, anything to add? Well, on the subject of unity, uh, I think the Democrats are going to have a better shot at, at revealing that to the country. Uh, the Republicans in this last convention, you know, we had a unique situation. We have a former president who is now running for office again. You would think that the, the, there would be a closure of ranks around him from all aspects of the Republican Party. Uh, but you don't see George W. Bush there speaking. You don't see uh, a cabinet members that he worked with day in and day out coming forward to advocate for his election. Some of them are uh, in prison, though, Joe. you got to be fair. <laughs> yeah, they, they, they were exposed. But... Uh, uh, but, you know, in the Democrat side, you're going to see Obama. You're going to see the Clintons. You're going to see folks who, you know, are going to close ranks and show more uh, more support, I think, uh, coming out of the convention. And I think that'll be to the Democrats' advantage. 
Final 60 seconds back to you, Billy. Yeah, I think it's going to be interesting. I do think that the uh, uh, the Democrats probably watched the RNC and ensured that nobody got off rails, that everybody stuck with the same, will stick with the same message. And that's going to be the message, uh, I think, threefold. One, unity. Second is looking forward. And the second one is joy. And you're seeing a lot of that coming out of what we're seeing at this point in time. We'll be able to uh, carry it through the, uh, the DNC. I think they probably will. With issue number three, Senator Jason Barrett. Uh, and some recent polls indicate that there has been a slight bump for Kamala Harris nationally. Uh, but when you look at some of the Rust Belt states, uh, Wisconsin, Michigan, um, that she hasn't really seen that bump and the polls there still show her even in some cases down a couple of points uh i don't think it's up for much debate that that donald trump has a much clearer path to 270. is there a path for kamala harris to 270 and what is that best path is that best path through the rust belt or is that best path uh through states like uh Nevada and Arizona that have uh, abortion issues on the ballot, uh, and then potentially Pennsylvania. Let me just compliment you on getting through best path four <laughs> times in a very short period of time. Most could not have handled that. Well, I know one that couldn't. <laughs> Let's go to him right now. <laughs> He's been snarky, is he, Rob? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, Jason, at this point in time, polls are all over the place. But what it has shown uh, in all the polls, composite, is that. Uh, there was a major deficit for the Democrats uh, prior to as long as Biden's on the ticket. Now that he's off the ticket, uh, there's been a real surge. And the surge has been is beyond the statistical uh, variability. It is it's it's real with the surge. Now, are all the polls unanimous at this point in time? No. But if you look at some of the polls that have historically been the um, uh, uh, been the more accurate, such as the Cook report, uh, shows that uh, Harris has a uh, has a two to three to four point lead in the Rust Belt, has a uh, one to two or even lead in the Sun Belt. The exception being Nevada, uh, uh, even in North Carolina, even in Georgia, uh, up a little bit in Arizona. So again. The polls are shot in time. You have to look at them in composite. I think it's way too early to read too much into it. But if you do look at the polls, there are reasons for the Republicans to be nervous. In fact, one of the Republican operatives said the other day, uh, one of the real troubling signs for us is the softening that we see in states such as Florida and Texas. Whereas it's uh, so the the polls are showing a uh, disturbing trend uh, for the Republicans, but it's at this point in time a long way to go. Nobody loves polling more than Mike Carl. Go right ahead, Michael. Well, that, that's a <laughs> cynical statement because I'm, I'm I have very little regard for the accuracy or meaningfulness of, of polling. You mean I got that intro wrong? Yeah, uh, you, 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 you're only 180 degrees off. But but uh, 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 the the whole thing about you know even even if there's a degree of accuracy, the like the the decline in Florida and Texas, I'll put a lot of money on the that that Florida and Texas are going to be in the electoral college for Trump. Oh, I think you're exactly okay. Right. Okay, yeah, nobody, so, so, nobody's saying that. So Mike. so nobody's so so that. it just matters. You know, the difference between people who respond to polls and people who go vote on election day, you know, is 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 significant. And and uh, I so I, I'm you know, I obviously a huge swing in polls would be a little concerning, but I put a lot less weight on them than than other people do. I want to get this right for the next intro, Mike. So not a fan of polling or a big fan of polling? Which one was that again? <laughs> not. No. Not. Yes, I make sure I got that, that right there. Uh, Mr. Schultz. Yes. Um, there's been a, um, a surge since in the three and a half weeks or whatever since she became the candidate. Um, I think her pick for the vice president uh, is, is an awful likable guy. And he seems to have done a good job in Minnesota as the governor. Um, in Florida, interestingly enough, you know, usually when you're running for president, you go to the places where the race is close 
and you campaign there. What Donald Trump's done for the last two weeks is stay in Florida. And as he stays in Florida, and you look at the polls over that period of time, it's getting closer and closer in Florida. He needs to get out of Florida before he loses it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and so, and I really think that he is so dissipated cognitively that he's going to have a problem making the kind of strenuous, day-to-day, go-every-day run from now to the end of this election that's going to be required in these uh, tight uh, states. Um, I I just, uh, you know, I think that what was Joe Biden's problem is now Donald Trump's problem. And that's going to be uh, an issue greater and greater going forward, especially the more he talks without a script. Um, because the more he talks without a script, the more wandering and um, goofy the comments become. And I think that uh, is going to eventually make a difference in this race. Torts? Uh, well, under the category of don't worry what they say, watch what they do, uh, the Trump campaign was in North Carolina just a day or two ago. Uh-oh. That's not a good sign. Um, and, and I think what you are seeing here, to whatever degree you, you put weight on these polls, a second path has potentially opened up for the Harris Walls ticket. It used to be when, when Biden was at the top of the ticket, it was clear. It was the blue wall, it was Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania. He had to win those or he was done. Now it's possible that if Harris wins Georgia, Nevada, Arizona, and Carolina, she doesn't need Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, or Michigan. Or she can get a combination of some of those states and still get to 270. So a second path has opened up, again, if you put some weight on the recent polling. And I can tell you, uh, you know, JB's right. This abortion issue is going to play in Nevada, where it's on the ballot, in Arizona, where it's on the ballot, potentially in Montana, if you're worried about the U.S. Senate, where it's going to go on the ballot here any day. Uh, and if we look at the Senate races in Nevada, Jackie Rosen is going to win that Senate seat. She's going to retain it for the Democrats, and she's winning by a large margin. In Arizona, Ruben Gallego is going to clean Kerry Lakes' clock. Uh, so the, the momentum it right now is running towards the Democrats in some of these states that just two months ago were being written off when Biden was at the top of the ticket. That is concerning, I believe, for the Trump campaign, which is why they're shuffling the deck and hiring and firing people. Uh, They just brought aboard Corey Lewandowski yesterday, despite having to fire him in 2021. He's back on the campaign uh, staff. So things are not great right now with the Trump campaign. They're reacting uh, in a way that tells you they're concerned. And I think it's a trend that they're going to have to hope they could reverse here in the next month. We had Lewandowski on this show several times leading up to the 20 election there. Go ahead, Bill. Yeah, Joe, you mentioned abortion is an issue. There's going to, the abortion is going to be a ballot issue on eight states, possibly 11 states. Uh, so that's a large number of states to have an abortion as, a, as an issue that will could very easily uh, uh, influence the results of the presidential election, uh, voting. Yeah, this is the first there, time that issue has been brought up, by the way, on the show today. There, There is a um, large number of those uh, toss-up states that contain a g- very great number of childless cat ladies and postmenopausal <laughs> women uh, without grandchildren. And I think they're taking very seriously and personally – the insults that are being laid, laid upon them by Mr. Vance. And so I think we're going to see a real surge of the women's vote uh, this year. 90 seconds to wrap it up, Chase. Well, Joe, thank you for answering the question about the, the path forward. And I, I, you kind of answered in where I, the direction of where the question was going. Um, but of those, and I want to kind of go back to the, the 
uh, eight states. And I was hoping that was going to be Bill's question because I think that uh, is really could play a, a factor in this, the outcome of this race. But of those eight states, uh, two of them that we've talked about, Nevada and Arizona, are the only two that are really battleground states. Florida's on that list, too. And I think that, the, you know, what you may see instead of a 12-point lead, you may now see a six-point lead or, or victory because of that issue. Uh, there's another state that is a potential to have the ballot uh, have it on the have a, an abortion referendum on the ballot, and that's Nebraska, which isn't a battleground state, so to speak. But Nebraska is one of the two states that divide or can divide their electoral college votes. And that second congressional district out there, which is uh, the Omaha area, uh, has in the past couple cycles been able, the Democrat has been able to win that. I think if that abortion issue comes on the ballot in Nebraska, I think that is a done deal for that one uh, electoral vote for, for Harris. So I was trying to figure out or, or get the panel's opinion on who can get to 270, can she get there, and what's the best best path, see I screwed it up this time, <laughs> best path forward. I, I still think it's a long shot. I still think there are far more options for Donald Trump. But the point, the statistics I presented, it looks like the Sun Belt's in play and the Rust Belt is, is now favoring Harris but not following the national polls. That was my yeah. point, was that the national poll, she's seeing the same bump in the Rust Belt as nationally, and if you, whatever bump you see nationally, she should see a bigger one in the Rust Belt, which was mine. It was this date in 1977, the king of rock and roll, Elvis Presley, passed away. I was but a mere 14-year-old mm. at the time, and that was pretty devastating news to a lot of folks in 1977. And now people are talking about Donald Trump as Fat Elvis in his Fat Elvis time, which I think is really disrespectful to Elvis. <laughs> you just can't resist, can you, Larry? <laughs> you just can't resist. <laughs> um, does the panel feel that Joe Biden deserves any credit for the reduction of inflation below 3% and the reduction of drug prices? I want to start with the biggest Biden supporter in the room, Michael Carl. He loves polls. He loves Biden. Two things he can't live without. <laughs> well, if if uh, if somebody's putting out a fire that they started, uh, <laughs> I don't know if they Doesn't they deserve a lot of credit. But that that that's the truth of the matter. <laughs> that was um, pretty quick, Mike. Nothing else. Uh, that, you know, I think that says it. I mean, we got ten minutes to fill on this subject. <laughs> well, it was going to be over in fifteen days, and of course, if it had been. The fire would have never started. But then we had to bail the whole country out because um, uh, the president in 2020 um, didn't bother messing with COVID. I mean, there was a huge tranche of spending. Now they've got the Inflation Reduction Act, which is going to bring down just the 10 drugs they announced the other day will save Medicare $6 billion dollars. Donald Trump um, served in office for a year and a half after COVID first came in. So, yeah. And 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 it it was, and there were tremendous, you know, and both parties put billions of dollars into supporting, you know, people and for relief and and but that was going on. But the fact is that Trump had that was managing that disaster and. And Biden came in with the biggest misrepresentation in the history of, of federal uh, uh, legislation called the Inflation Reduction Act, and it was designed as an Inflation Promotion Act, and, and only because uh, Joe Manchin slowed it down a little, but, but Harris, you know, cast the, the, the breaking and, vote, and, and that thing created... That's what created the inflation was the so, was was the, the destruction of 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 of, of uh, energy economy and, so, and 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 many many other problems in the in the U.S. economy and and the we, we lead the, the we lead the world in oil production we lead the world and we did more that. than the Saudis okay but, and and, 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 but and how so, much how much we lead the world and how much uh, is suppressed. By the, by the so-called Inflation Reduction Act is the problem, and that's why we had inflation. And, and we we had inflation. Two, we was had inflation less was, than three percent. Inflation was caused by excessive government spending under the Biden administration, and 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 it hurt the economy, and Never. the ta and the tax revenues were suppressed be, because the economy was hurt. 
Donald Trump still leads the deficit uh, crowd. He still leads it. That's a lie. Oh, uh, he did. He did. He had eight trillion in new debt in in four years. That is factual, Mike. I have looked that up. <laughs> eight trillion in new debt. It's actually, so, eight point two. And when you are going to say that all this government spending causes inflation, some of the Inflation Reduction Act is the reduction of these drug prices. So how exactly does it make a bigger deficit when Medicare saves six billion dollars? That that that's that's it's all about government suppression of the free enterprise system. <laughs> and no, and, and 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 I'm telling you, the the the, the deficit, the dollar amount of the deficit. Because of the crisis uh, 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 of, of COVID, of course there was a big number, but the fact is that the, the uh, inflation had come down when Trump left office and it skyrocketed because of Biden's legislation. Because everybody went back to work and all of a sudden they could afford to buy things. Look, when the United States Army buys pickup trucks... They don't go to Chevy and say, hey, charge us whatever you want, and we'll go ahead and pay it. But that is exactly what the federal government did because we couldn't get a single uh, Republican vote to stop it with Medicare, with Big Pharma, for years. We spent more and more and more and more money, and it was basically a subsidy to Big Pharma, which, you know, part of Big Pharma also gave us the sad situation in in West Virginia where we have the highest opioid overdose uh, death rate in the nation. So, yeah, we needed to reduce the amount of money Medicare was spending, and not a single Republican voted to do that. That It's it's very clear. Almost cheetah-esque. I enjoyed that. (laughs) Mr. Stumblefield. Yeah, I think there's two parts to this question. One, the uh, uh, reduction in inflation uh, and the reduction in drug prices. And I think they should be viewed separately. Uh, The reduction in inflation, that's an awful hard thing to get your get your arms around uh we're in a crisis mode with covid we had to take action and uh and and the only way to curb it was to an influx of of money which both parties did both uh both administrations did now it's awful easy to look back in second hand and say we put too much money in but in the real time real t- uh the real time i thought both parties responded the way they felt they had to so uh, yeah we have a lot of inflation uh, uh there's one more guilt than the other i'm not sure that i would say they are so but they the fact that inflation is coming down now i think is commendable uh the other thing to me the more important is reduction in drug prices this is something that administrations have been talking about for the last 25 to 30 years they have not been able to do it uh biden for whatever the reason was uh was able to do it and this is something that we as a as a society will benefit from so that people that drug prices are more affordable especially those with diabetes with cancer and the like i think that uh, uh this is something that biden's taken a victory lap for he well deserves it because he's did something that his predecessors were, were unable to do mr there you go mr ferretti well uh larry's question was does biden uh deserve uh, kudos for the slowing of inflation. And, and I'm of the mindset, I don't hold him solely responsible for the increased inflation that occurred because, yeah, there's been a lot of discussion about a lot of money into the system, but uh, we also had severe supply chain disruption. And I can give you a plenty of examples of how prices were had to be raised because of these corporations scrambling to get supply all over the world. And we know we went through that part, and that was part of the inflationary pressures we dealt with, as well as the rest of the world. What I do know is that this country has rebounded much better than the rest of the world. And for that, you look to leadership. And I, and that's where I'm going to give the president some, some, uh, some kudos. And I'm also going to cite the, uh, the Fed and, and Jerome Powell. It's an independent Fed. Hopefully, uh, even if Trump wins an election, it remains independent, even though he doesn't want it to be. Uh, an independent Fed has helped steer this 
economy in a very deft manner to the point where we might have a soft landing, despite economists saying that that was almost impossible to achieve. Uh, and and I, I think that that's uh, threading the needle in terms of monetary policy. And so I think you have to credit the Fed also for so far looking like they've uh, hit a home run here. Mr. Barrett. Well, I think that if you ask voters uh, – if they feel like inflation is curbed and if they compare their grocery prices, building supply prices, fuel prices now to three and a half years ago, I think they would say, no, it hasn't been curbed. And and everyone's made the point about this uh, huge spending uh, under both administrations uh, and, and really with um, very little safeguards, or very little proof that, that some of this money was actually needed the way some of it was handed out uh, to businesses businesses that were, were flourishing during the COVID, still received tremendous amounts of money. Uh, and whenever you infuse that kind of cash and, you know, people are out here, the, the, I remember the used car market going through the roof because we just gave everybody all the money that they needed and they went out and spent it on stuff and and that's what people do when you give them um, money that they don't um, necessarily need at that time people certainly and and so what's happened now um, people are struggling because when those prices go up uh, they certainly don't come down at that same rate and uh, but I, th I don't think it matters what this panel thinks I think it matters what voters think and I don't believe voters feel like the inflation has been curbed anytime you go to the grocery store you can certainly feel that right all right. Uh, so that uh, then comes back to you, Larry. Uh, yes. The um, I, I mean, um, I think Joe uh, had had some good points here. I also believe that inflation is a measure by which prices are going up, and prices are still going up. However, it's under three percent, which is a lot better than where we were. Um, at nine or ten percent so if the average person is looking for the what they used to pay a dollar 89 for to cost a dollar 89 again as long as there is any inflation that is largely never going to be true um, what we also have right now is an increase in wages which is outpacing the increase in inflation and so uh, eventually this will begin. This is the way you do it. You can do it another way. That's happened many times. You have a terrible recession. <laughs> Prices will come down during a recession. Unfortunately, you won't have a job, so you can't afford this stuff no matter what the price is. We're headed for a soft landing. A year ago, all the economists were telling us, oh, this is going to crash. It didn't. And, you know, a couple of weeks ago, the stock market took a little hiccup. And everybody was like, uh oh, are we starting now? It doesn't appear that's going to happen. And that's, that's uh, you know, they split the difference and threw the ball right over the plate. I think it's a, a great effort by the Biden administration. As we uh, speak here, stocks this morning are opening up slightly lower after a big day yesterday. On to issue number five, the anchor leg, Mr. Michael Carr. I want to get to something that I hope will be far less controversial. Uh, the, the, the proposal that you know, Trump, Trump threw out and then Harris latched onto it to uh, exempt tips and gratuities from federal income tax, I think is a, a bad idea for a lot of reasons. I mean, the, the, list them, please. The administration of, of, of that exemption will be difficult. Uh, people will still want to, uh, you know, people that pay tips and pay gratuities will still want to deduct that, you know, if it's a taxable, you know, event, if the pay, you know, paying for the services is, is, is itself is, is deductible for income tax purposes. And, and the people that, you know, who's, and a lot of you know low and moderate moderate income level people don't have access to tips won't get this benefit because you know the this is structure of their jobs and the work they do it, the, you know our system doesn't uh, uh, you know involve gratuities and and so I th I think it's just a, a, a 
uh, it was a bad idea, and, and and Trump started it. I'll I'll readily acknowledge that. It's just a, it was just a, a an attempt to to uh, you know. Uh, gain support from a limited and that's the problem a limited segment of our working class so tips taxing them good idea says michael carl tax all uh earned income and and tips are part of that all right what do you got larry schultz well one one issue that immediately jumps to my mind with any change in the tax code but especially one like this is will people like donald trump when uh, they make a profit on a building, try to call part of it a gratuity <laughs> by putting it in the in the real estate contract. If you think there's there was not a conscious thought by him before he endorsed that idea of doing that very thing, um, I I got a bridge to sell you. Well, thank you for uh, coming up with a creative example <laughs> to support my position. Well, it's it's supported directly by the facts. I think. <laughs> 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 this, this building sold at cost the rest was the tip <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> mr ferretti well uh, that's one of the criticisms uh, uh, that the, the the folks who can afford to have an accountant with a sharp pencil are going to figure out ways to reclassify their income and, and have it be tax exempt this whole proposal mike I'm, I'm on board with you this whole proposal is just pandering for the nevada vote where right. a lot of people work for tips I think it's uh, in Vegas, 26% of people employed uh, are employed with tip income. So that's uh, that's all this is about. It's electioneering, pandering. I don't know if it's going to have any legs, but uh, it, a whole host of problems, as Mike points out, are, are going to be raised if, if this would ever become real policy. And uh, I, I just... I don't think it's going to be something that has legs beyond the election. You know, the the 26 percent in Nevada would have been something that uh, would have raised eyebrows. But since COVID, everywhere you go, every place you pay, they also have a line for a tip. I went to my doctor's office the other day. It was copay and then a tip for the doctor. I mean, come on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that, that's a whole yeah. other subject, Rob. And don't get me going on that. That is, I, I, I cannot stand that. I mean, come on. You you go to a counter and pick up something and they want you to tip them. What service did you get? You know what the I mean, tip you're I, you're, you're, the tip I gave my doctor? Get warmer hands. All right, now on to Mr. Barrett here. <laughs> Maybe that's not what the tip line meant. I don't know. Um, I, I mean, these guys are right. And, and Joe, you you said exactly what I was going to say is that this is pandering to Las Vegas hospitality workers. Um, and I think that to Larry's point, and I'm not going to go down the road of, of Donald Trump doing this, but but I think employers that offer any type of service, whether it's a, a restaurant, a mechanic, whatever, uh, the labor charges now are going to be gratuities. And, you know, I think that you would see some of this service industry start to putting on um, automatic gratuities and you see that at some restaurants um, when you have a party of six or more uh, I think that if, if this were the case that um, uh, that you would see these automatic gratuities for all employees I, it wasn't that long ago maybe a year ago summer and I went out to Denver and there was this, a, a large automatic gratuity at a, at a restaurant because they were paying not only the, the wait staff but um, the the kitchen staff as well uh, in gratuity. So I think you're going to see an explosion of that. Um, and, and to Mike's point about all the different uh, tax reasons, um, but it, it's all about pandering um, after election day. No one will talk about this. Bill, what do you think? Anything else to add? Actually, no, Rob. <laughs> That's a, thanks for calling me last because I I have insight on this issue that I did not have before. Uh, it may be pandering. Uh, I am still sympathetic to uh, the lower rate wage uh, uh, sector of our society, uh, and if we can increase the wages of the of the service personnel, uh, the waitresses and the waiters and the like, so be it. I'm for that. Uh, there are guard. I uh, was not a. I did not realize until Mike Carl raised the subject that probably very strict guardrails need to be put in place if this does become law uh, to limit it to a fairly small sector. But if that can be done, uh, sure it's pandering. But I'm supporting the pandering. But isn't all tax law pandering? Isn't pretty much yeah, every tax the, law that's yeah, been passed yeah, the, yeah, to trying to alter degree, behavior yeah, or pander yeah, to a specific yeah, group? Yeah. Right? Why, yeah. why would this be different? This is an interesting uh, thing to tackle because tip income is probably 
in the category of the most underreported income that exists. So you're already paying taxes on a smaller portion of what you're actually getting to begin with. I don't know how some places handle it maybe more strictly than others, but in the jobs I've had where they're, you're getting tips, it has been associated that, uh, listen, we're reporting you got this. Anything that you got over that, that's up to you report if you want to, but we're going to report a minimum of this on your income as tips. And that's kind of how that's dealt with. And for the, I, I've I've yet to meet a person who said, yeah, I'll report all of it on on my taxes. I, I've not met well, that person. Well, but a lot of it has to do with what's documented and what's just cash on the table. Correct. Yeah. Right. I mean, and, so. Well, if you want to be able to go buy a house and get a loan or whatever, I mean, you're going to have to show income, so you can't hide too much of that. <laughs> yeah, that but when you're silly. when you're 19, Polish. you're probably not buying a house. Of course, though. right? But there are a lot of hospitality workers that aren't 19. I mean, there's yeah, in Las Vegas, there's a there's, there's a fair number of hospitality workers who know they're never going to be able to afford a house. Oh, well, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> and so that 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 issue, while it it is uh, an important one. Yeah. Are you know that issue is a real problem because the price of real estate now means two bartenders, man. Unless they own the bar, I don't they're know. not going to. Some, some bartenders <laughs> make bartenders some money. Man. Make more money than you think they. Do. Yeah, I think some bartenders <laughs> make some serious cash yeah. in the pocket, right? Uh, Mike, final thought goes back to you on this. I just so much appreciate the fact that uh, I tried to have a non. A uh, controversial point, and that's the way it worked out. Yeah, and I tell something that'll get you riled up. I don't think you should have to pay money uh, taxes on capital gains. Period. End of story. Stock investments, that sort of thing. I, I think there should be no income tax on that whatsoever. You want to find a way to lift people up into a different classification, right? On in income, don't tax their capital gains. Uh, people who have capital gains are typically the most affluent people. Sure. So, so, so that, but, that, that's that's the most that's regressive. But the most saying. affluent people have the most of everything. That's just the nature of being affluent. But and you're you're going to exacerbate that fact. If you're if you're with, with, with the rule you're calling if, for. If you're, but you're going to exacerbate. I mean, that's, tax that's coming that. from a you know. If you're 25, capitalist. if you're 20 years old and you bought stock in a tech company a few years back, the capital gains will blow away the income that you make. That could, those capital yeah, gains could lift cap, you into a whole other classification. The capital gain, until they're a hundred percent tax, they're going to blow it away. I'm taking all the risk buying the stock. If I lose, the best I can deduct is three thousand. But if I gain, I got to pay taxes on all of it. That's bad tax law, Mike Carl, and you're behind it because you're a tax attorney. This is on you, baby. <laughs> Get your final thoughts together. Eight seconds of peace after we return. Final thoughts are brought to you by the Skinner Accident and Injury Attorney, SkinnerWins.com. Joe Ferretti, eight seconds go. The Saudi Arabian golf tournament starts today at the Greenbrier. I hope the golfers hurry up before the course gets sold at auction. <laughs> Larry Schultz. <laughs> Hard work pays off in the future, but laziness pays off now. I agree. Bill's double field. <laughs> Enjoy this weather. Wonderful weather. Mr. Michael Carl. If I win the Mega Millions tonight, I'll buy the Greenbrier. Oh, that's very generous of you, Mr. Sis Senator Jason Barrett. Uh, after some recent social media posts, I'm reminded of this Babe Ruth quote. The loudest boos always come from the cheapest seats. Oh, okay. It's 10 o'clock. The Dave Ramsey Show is next. Have a great weekend. This is Talk Radio, WNR Martinsburg and TV 10, and we'll talk with you again in 70 short hours. It's 5 o'clock somewhere.